Welcome back. And for this first session of the uh, afternoon session of the Future of the American Child Journalism Training, we're going to be focusing on a topic that many of you expressed in your applications for this fellowship, uh, interest in going deeper and learning more about the immigrant populations in your cities and regions. And so we thought we would, would spend time focusing on the, the topic of undocumented children and youth and protecting their rights and safety. And when I looked around for people who could best inform us on this topic, I came across Dahlia Castillo, Castillo Granados. She is co-founder of the Children's Immigration Law Academy, a project of the American Bar Association's Commission on Immigration. She's a frequent speaker on special immigrant juvenile status, and she led the effort at the ABA to advocate for deferred action for um, youth stuck in the visa backlog. We're also joined by Amy Korolev. She is the Interim Director of Programs and Legal Director at the South Texas Pro Bono Asylum Representation Project, or PROBAR, also a project of the ABA. And she's devoted her career to providing free, high-quality legal services to asylum seekers, immigrant children, and adults, and survivors of violence and human trafficking. These are, are important, uh, profoundly important issues that were part of the reason we chose to have this training in McAllen. And so we have, again, two experts in these fields, and I hope you will take advantage uh, not only of learning from their presentation, but also of uh, counting on their knowledge and their uh, insights. So please, um, take it away. I think, Dahlia, you're going to be the first speaker. Good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be here. I apologize in advance for my mask. Can everybody hear me OK? Yeah. All right. Just let me know if I start mumbling. Um, again, thank you for, for having us here. It's a real pleasure to talk about unaccompanied children. We definitely left some space in the presentation for questions, so uh, we welcome those at any time if you want to, um, to ask a question during the presentation or you know, we can wait until the end to ask all of the questions. Um, so as Rachel mentioned, my name is Dahlia and I am the director of the Children's Immigration Law Academy, which is a project of the American Bar Association. And a little bit about, my, about me before I get started. Um, I first learned about unaccompanied children in 2006. I was in law school. Um, I was a second year law student and I joined the immigration clinic. I, one of my um, clinical professors was, had a contract to provide Know Your Rights presentations and legal screenings to children that were detained at a shelter. And so we went down with her, a few students and, and uh, our professor went down to Corpus Christi. Um, I went to law school in Houston um, to provide this training for these children. And I had no idea that there were children that were detained in these sort of settings that you know, had just come across the border that were waiting to get reunified with family members. And our project was to teach these kids about immigration law because the reality was that they were likely going to have to represent themselves in immigration court. So we came up with this presentation on how to, you know, sort of an immigration law 101. At that point, I was just learning it myself. Um, so, you know, we found it very difficult. We found it really hard to teach 16 and 17 year old boys about immigration law, enough for them to know how to represent themselves in immigration court once they were released into the community. And you know, that's when I decided that I would dedicate my career to this population of children um, and have done that ever since. Um, so to get us started here, I wanted to tell you a bit about my organization, um, the Children's Immigration Law Academy. Um, we got started in 2015, and it was really in response to the increase in the number of children that were coming across the border. Um, there was an influx in children, but there was also an influx of funding to provide legal services for children. And having started in this field when there was not a lot of guidance, um, 
my colleague and I decided that we would, be, we would provide that guidance to new attorneys and new staff that we're going to work with unaccompanied children. Um, and that was the idea behind CELA. So we are a legal resource center. We don't provide direct legal services to children, but instead we support attorneys and legal staff who are going to do this very important work. We do that through trainings and um, through, by offering technical assistance um, and by hosting working groups and by creating resources. So our website is, um, has a lot of resources on it, cilacademy.org. Um, we, uh, and we just try to provide, you know, we try to build the capacity of the organizations that are already on the ground doing this really important work. Um, and my next slide is about ProBar services, so I'm going to let Amy touch on that for a sec. Yes. Thank you all for having us here. Can you hear me all right? Okay. So um, I work at ProBar, uh, as has already been communicated, and we are in Harlingen, Texas, which is just uh, about 40 minutes from here. So if you were to, I have a map uh, that I'll, I'll show you later on in the presentation, but we are just uh, east of McAllen, McAllen being the biggest uh, city in the RGB where you are right now. So um, is this everyone's first trip to the borderlands? No? Nope. Some of you? Okay. Um, so ProBar has been around since 1989, um, and it has always been affiliated, well, um, almost always been affiliated with the American Bar Association, and it was started to be... Uh, it was started to provide services to detained adults uh, here at the border, uh, just seeing the huge uptick in, um, in detentions and the need for counsel right at the moment somebody enters. So a lot of the work is also done more interior in the US and we'll focus on that. Um, and then a few years later, we uh, started our children's program and it's now been our largest program. Uh, we provide services to detained children and adults, uh, as well as released individuals, but we provide services at 23 uh, Office of Refugee Resettlement Shelters here in the Valley, uh, in addition to two adult detention facilities. We provided services for the Migrant Protection Protocols, or MPP, out of Brownsville, uh, which is no longer in operation, thankfully. You can see a little bit of the tent structure still there if you make it to the port of entry in Brownsville. Um, and then we provide services in the Harlingen Immigration Court, as well as the detained adult court. Um, so even though there are shelters, they are, um, they are detention centers, so um, they are jail. For, for young children. So we, uh, as Dahlia mentioned, we are just different arms, different ways of approaching the issue to provide representation to children. So um, we seek to, we have three main buckets uh, in our services to inform both children and adults of their legal rights, to represent and to connect them to psychosocial services. Many of, uh, much of that we do in-house, but we also work with a large network uh, of providers to, to really, you know, hit it from the legal side as well as the other needs of the children. So, okay. Thanks, Amy. So we really have these sort of five uh, topics that we're gonna cover. Um, and we thought we'd start with migration. Um, and a lot of what we see is humanitarian reasons for migration. And I thought I'd start by explaining a little bit about the specific population that we're talking about, and that is unaccompanied children. And this is a federally defined term. Um, it was first defined in the Homeland Security Act of 2002. Of course, there were children coming across the border alone prior to that, but it's the first time that it was actually defined under federal law. And Part of the reason that you know, it came about is because of some federal litigation that you might have heard about. Um, the Flores Settlement Agreement came about a few years earlier um, due to the conditions of detention of children. And the Homeland Security Act um, defined unaccompanied children and it also transferred the care of, of the detention of children from, uh, from INS, which is no longer an agency um, that was dismantled after 9-11, um, and the Department of Homeland Security Act was created, the Department of Homeland Security was created, and transferred the, the care of children to 
the Office of Refugee Resettlement, which is an agency within the Department of Health and Human Services. So an unaccompanied child is defined as somebody who's under 18 years of age, has no lawful immigration status, and no parent or legal guardian in the US available to provide care and physical custody. Now the reality is that many of these children might have a parent or legal guardian in the US, but at the time that they enter the US, they do not. And so they've, if they enter uh, without a parent or a legal guardian, then, and they are apprehended by custom, a customs or border protection agent, then they're going to be designated an unaccompanied child. And this brings about certain protections. Um, just a kind of picture of who these children are. Most of them are from Central America. So the top three receiving, the top three countries um, that are represented are Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. We've seen a huge uptick in Guatemalan children um, recently, uh, where it used to be a little bit more um, spread out between the three countries. We see very few children that come across from, or that make it to ORR from Mexico, and that's because of the way, um, that's because of U.S. policy. So basically, if you, and, and now federal law, um, it's been integrated into our laws as well. But if you are a child from Mexico, then you would be automatically returned to Mexico. Um, you know, the technical term is that you're allowed to withdraw your admission from the U.S. unless a CBP agent uh, believes that you have a credible fear of returning to Mexico, there's some indicia of trafficking, um, or if the child can't make an independent decision to withdraw their admission. But otherwise, they are automatically returned, and that's why we see very few Mexican children um, as part of this population. And then all other countries, 7%. This last year, we saw um, an increase in the amount of Afghan children, of course, um, that were coming into ORR. Um, and you know we've definitely seen an increase um, in recent years in the amount of unaccompanied children that are coming across the border. Um, when I started this work back in 2006 in law school, there was about 8,000 unaccompanied children coming across the border. Um, and last year, that number was 152,000. So um, a huge increase in, in a very short time period. Um, but of course, I think the you know, what we want to convey to you is that, you know, these reasons are humanitarian. Um, UNHCR did a report um, a few years ago to ask children why they were coming um, to the U.S. And, you know, as you probably guessed, there's a variety of reasons why children come. Um, and there's not really any one reason. So often it could be that a child feels unsafe in their neighborhood because there might be uh, gang violence um, or some other criminal organization um, causing havoc in the community. It could be because they feel unsafe in their home. Um, maybe there's domestic violence or they're suffering from um, an incidence of sexual assault. And, and you know, it could be um, that, you know, they're dealing with extreme poverty um, or lack of enough food. Um, we've heard from Guatemalan children that, um, you know, their families um, survived on subsistence farming and, you know, all of a sudden they're no longer able to uh, grow enough food for the entire family. And so once a child decides that they need to leave their community, then the next thing to do is decide where they're going to go. And oftentimes children come to the U.S. because they might have a family member here. It could be a parent um, or somebody else that, that they want to reunite with um, or some extended family member that has just has agreed to take care of them, you know, once they get here, um, or it could be because you know they they know that there's um, more opportunities here in the U.S. Uh, with education or or work prospects, and and that could be a reason. Although you know, for the most part, kids do have family here in the U.S. or somebody that they're gonna they intend to reunite with. Um, so one of the things we hear often um, is, you know, talk of the border. And of course, we pay attention to border policies. Um, we pay attention to, to numbers of children coming across the border, things like that. 
But we really want to stress that it's just the beginning of the story. It's, you know, children um, are, most of them are going to integrate into communities um, and, you know, be part of, be part of our community. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, the, their path is much longer than just what happens at the border. But to start there um, about, you know, understanding the border, you know, I talked about this somewhat, but there's a lot of agencies involved. There's, you know, this whole process of, of um, how to deal with unaccompanied children. So at the border, you'll see the um, CBP agents who apprehend the child. Um, they'll be taken to an, a CBP holding facility where they will be questioned. Um, they, the CBP agents take their information and create something called a notice to appear. It's a charging document. It explains what law they violated and you know, why they have to go to immigration court, basically, because that charging document will eventually be um, sent to the immigration court to start removal proceedings. But also, those, you know, being deemed an unaccompanied child means you get some certain protections. And one of those protections is that you'll go to an ORR shelter within 72 hours. For the most part, that is the case unless there's too many children uh, at the border and not enough uh, permanent shelter space to accommodate them. Uh, but most children are transferred within 72 hours. And they'll be transferred to an ORR shelter that can be anywhere in the US uh, where they sort of start um, their process. So this is actually an old uh, map of where shelters are. There are more now um, and could be in different locations, but just gives you a sense of you know, where shelters are um, and they're all over. Um, so the you know, CBP and ORR will decide where the child should be um, sent um, to be in these ORR detention facilities. There's about uh, 200 state licensed facilities right now in about in 22 states. Uh, this information is, uh, is recent. Um, there was about 10,000 kids in shelter care as of the middle of December. And the average length of stay for a child in ORR care was about 28 days. Most children are older. So 72% of children um, are over the age of 14. Um, and most of them, about two thirds, are boys. So what happens at the ORR shelter? So they're transferred to an ORR shelter within 72 hours. Well, then the ORR caseworkers or the, the shelter staff, I should say, um, does various assessments. They take their biographic information. There might be a medical, they, they need to be medically cleared. Um, there might be a mental health evaluation if there's indicia of, of mental health issues. The, there's legal service providers um, that work outside of the shelters, but then those legal service providers will send somebody to the shelter to provide a Know Your Rights presentation, just like I did back in 2006 as a law student, and do a legal screening. And this is you know, part of the work that ProBar does here in the shelters in the Valley. ORR will need to work to identify a sponsor um, so that the child can reunify with the sponsor. Um, I touched really briefly on the floor settlement agreement, which I think is on a dip on another slide as well. But you know, basically that settlement agreement says that a child should be in the least restrictive setting. Um, so ORR is going to try their best to get children out of detention as fast as possible. And if a child can't reunify with the sponsor for any reason, you know, the, the child could seek a voluntary departure. I think that's pretty rare nowadays. Um, although there might be some kids that that do that. Um, they could be transferred to a long-term foster care uh, facility, or they could age out of care. If they age out of care, you know, hopefully at that time, ICE and ORR are working together to, uh, to release that child so that they don't have to go to adult detention. Once the child's in their community, then, that, then hopefully they'll get a referral to a organization in their community that can provide representation in immigration court. Sorry about that. Because as I mentioned, that notice to appear is that charging document is going to be used to start removal proceedings. So these are, you know, this means that the 
government is actively trying to deport this child, and they have to attend, the child has to attend immigration court. There's no right to appointed counsel, um, even for children, and there's very few child-friendly procedures in immigration court. The immigration judge is gonna adjudicate the application for relief. The immigration judge is going to adjudicate an application for relief. That's, you know, that's what they're supposed to do. They can either grant that relief. They can, um, if the child asks for voluntary departure, they can, um, you know, decide that voluntary departure, um, that the that the child uh, merits a voluntary departure, or they can issue an order of relief. And there's very few ways that a child um, can avoid deportation. Um, and this is, you know, this is the hard work that attorneys do um, on the ground, um, trying to assess whether or not a child qualifies for one of these forms of relief. It could be special immigrant juvenile status, um, asylum, U visa, T visa, or VAWA. Um, these are the most common forms of relief for a child, and Amy's going to talk about special immigrant juvenile status and asylum in a second. A U visa is a, um, it's a, a visa for uh, somebody who is a, who might be a victim of a crime and so has cooperated with law enforcement. A T visa is for somebody who um, is the victim of human trafficking. And VAWA is for the spouse, spouse or child of a U.S. citizen um, or lawful permanent resident um, and has suffered domestic violence. So just to quickly go over that. And um, I just wanted to point out this video feature that um, I found very compelling. It's from the Marshall Project. Um, it's the, you know, the story of an unaccompanied child. And I think, you know, he's sort of a quintessential uh, client that you would come across as, as a children's immigration attorney. Um, and also, it's really important to center the voices of our clients. So. Um, I really like this video. It's about five minutes, so hopefully, if you have time, you'll take a look. And I think I'll turn it over to Amy. Yes. Just I understand that um, I'm, I'm Maria Carnalara with W9J. Hola. Um, I understand that uh, undocumented youth have a right to education by the Supreme Court. So I wonder. What law or what president says that undocumented youth don't have a right to representation? And I wonder, it, you know, compared to like international law, what other countries do, like where do we stand in terms of not giving, you know, in terms of this, right? That, the international perspective, I don't know. I don't know if Amy has um, any information on that, but you know, kids do have, anybody in immigration court has a right to counsel. They just don't have a right to counsel at government expense. Um, so they don't have a right to appointed counsel. Um, so if a child, you know, is not able to get not a, a pro bono attorney from one of the legal service providers or their family can't afford an attorney, then they would have to represent themselves. And that does happen way more often than necessary. Um, it's also important to note that this is a non-criminal proceeding. Although you're taking somebody's liberty away, they're detained, right? And this is a, is the decision in these cases will affect someone's life. It is a non-criminal administrative proceeding. And so the U.S. laws did not mandate that the government provide counsel. So uh, while, you know, we'll get to Health and Human Services try to provide additional resources to children to allow counsel similar to some of the work we do, right, um, and our mission at our respective organizations, um, it's, it's not a requirement. Hi, uh, Adam Eckelman with the Modesto Bee in Central California. Um, I was just wondering if you know how to like find a list or the locations of all those ORR shelters, um, and if you have any recommendations about how to best work with them. I know there's a lot of large kind of conglomerate nonprofits that own them, and I've tried in the past and had some challenges because of some of the sensitive nature. So any recommendations on how to work with them, how to get through to those groups uh, as reporters? 
their exact location is, you know, confidential, and that's, you know, due to the fact that there's children there, um, and, you know, it could be because family members <laughs> are trying to look for them, or, um, you know, it's to protect their 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 rights. I don't know if you had a, a different answer. I know that, you know, the chart that we showed a second ago where there were sort of these spots, um, the Texas Tribune, I think, did a, a FOIA request um, to try to get information about the locations. Um, but definitely, I think it, it is a safety concern for kids. We can identify the, the top cities they are because they're tied to uh, funded legal services providers. And so, you know, I can tell you the quantity of facilities we serve and that it's in, you know, the four counties, but uh, we are um, not permitted to disclose the locations. We did send, and we can share it with the whole group, there is a, uh, ORR has a, a website where you can apply to tour facilities in certain regions. And um, there are certain rules for the press that vary from, you know, legal service providers or uh, other, you know, uh, interested members of the public. They do allow that. It just has to be arranged in advance and they may restrict what level of access you have during that tour. Um, so uh, we can, or e you're welcome to share the, the email that I sent you, or I can share it out with the group too, and that would get you on the right track. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, so I just had, it's about the RR shelters, quickly. Um, I think you mentioned that they're all over the country, and I think CBP decides where individual kids go. Is Do you know how they make that decision? Is it arbitrary is it based like if they have family there like a lot of it is capacity of of the shelters I mean uh, and they're gonna build them in the in the need where where there's a need um, so that's why we do see a larger um, number of facilities in the Rio Grande Valley because about uh, I think it's one in four of those crossing will cross through our region um, but, uh, it, you know, outside of that, where the child is placed, it really depends on capacity. And even when ORR exceeds capacity, we will see the use of emergency intake sites. Um, because, as Dahlia mentioned, that 72-hour window, that is something in place by law, by litigation, by suing the government. And so it really is something that we're all... Um, as legal services providers providing services to these children, we are always asking, you know, how long were you in CBP? Because that is also known as La Hilera, right? Those are not great, they're not great, uh, um, not a super great environment. Uh, so that's why we want to move them outside to ORR. Um, but it's really hard to get a handle on that other than capacity levels. Why don't you go ahead with your, uh presentation and then we'll open it back up. Okay, great. Alrighty, so um, our next point that we really thought it was important to kind of lay the ground for um, was that immigration law is really complicated and while these are children and they are, um, almost all of them have a humanitarian reason for being here, it is simply not enough to you know, arrive in the U.S. and just be granted permission to be here, um, or to just get a work permit, or to, um, you know, get in line. Um, really, what is most important for any immigrant trying to stay in the U.S., whether you're a child or an adult, is if you have a hook in the law. You have to have a reason that the law will support you being here. Um, having a, a traumatic experience by itself, unfortunately, doesn't allow you to be here. Unless you can prove the reason grounded in the law, then you can have protection from deportation and you can have lawful status to remain in the U.S. Um, it, it, it's often, I think, an area that, um, and, and a lot of you, you know, if you've had experience in, in covering these fields, I think it makes more sense. But to just uh, the layperson and the public generally, it's really often a, a challenging concept to understand that it, it doesn't, uh, without one of these reasons for staying, you can't. So um, 
We, in terms of immigrating, so this would be um, not dealing with uh, a temporary visit, like a tourist visa, right, and you, a non-immigrant visa for just a temporary nature, but if you are seeking to live and reside permanently in the United States, these are your main buckets of um, areas for, for protection. So we have employment-based immigration. Um, this is different from just getting permission to work. This is you are coming through an employer, usually, who's sponsoring your visa to come to the US. So um, H-1B, H-2B, uh, we hear about those a lot and you know the big season for when those come in, but also all of the EB categories um, that range from you know, million dollar investors to, to companies starting out. Um, so that is its own area and it's often a very profitable. If you're working in immigration in that field, you're most likely representing the company. Um, Family-based immigration is also a huge area of immigration. So this is you have a connection to a US citizen or a legal permanent resident in the US. Um, your method and manner of entry and criminal history or previous time in the US are directly relevant to both of these and all of the areas. But um, family-based immigration, by and large, it's, it's important that you have a lawful um, entry. So if you attempted to en enter the US without inspection, it can be a challenge for, for immigrating this way. Um, and uh, it's not all family members, or the, the wait times vary in family immigration. Um, but for immediate relatives, it, it is uh, a little bit faster, so the, that it, uh, is spouses, children, and parents of US citizens, and spouses and children of legal permanent residents. Um, Humanitarian-based immigration, that is the slide that uh, Dahlia had up. Um, that is, uh, you know, different legal pathways to immigrate uh, for a humanitarian reason. The diversity lottery is country specific. It is indeed a lottery um, where uh, individuals will submit an application. They have to be from countries that have been uh, designated by the U.S. government that year as um, countries where we have lower populations uh, of that nationality inside the US and they can apply. And if they are uh, one of the, is it, it 50,000 a year? I think it's 50,000. Uh, then they, um, they can come in as a legal permanent resident. So, uh, and, and their family can come. Uh, and then we have certain more discretionary uh, types of relief like temporary protected status. Um, we're seeing that a lot in the news, additional countries getting that. Um, uh, or, um, you know, uh, more discretionary kind of what we saw with DACA, what we still see with those that continue to have DACA, deferred action for childhood arrival, um, and other more kind of discretionary relief, um, like uh, relief under the Convention Against Torture. So um, that starts our process. So here, um, if we were to look at percentages, these are for fiscal years, this is 2013 to 17. We likely saw, uh, well, I would be interested to see the, you know, 2020 to date. I bet we'd see different numbers just because of COVID and, and Title 42 uh, that have really uh, changed. Um, our, our immigration kind of world in the US. But here, um, these are the ways you know, to obtain a green card, which then puts you on the pathway to um, uh, citizenship. So we see about 45% here were immediate relatives of US citizens and 21% are other uh, family sponsored. So you know, the highest, uh, obviously, in this pie chart is all, all family based. Um, uh, roughly 13% are refugees and asylees, and we'll talk a little bit about the difference there. And then we have employment-based, and then very slim for diversity and others. So still primarily immigration through family is, is our highest, but we do see um, you know, the humanitarian uh, area growing. I would say if we were to 
think through this chart in terms of um, unaccompanied children, we do see, even though a lot of times we are providing uh, relief um, of a humanitarian nature, we do see family-based cases arise later in the immigration journeys of the children as well. So, but this is just giving the broad kind of overview. Um, I mentioned here uh, Title 42. So, you know, in March of 2020, approximately uh, around that time, we saw uh, a public health law known as Title 42 get implemented to shut our border uh, and to temporarily halt uh, immigration. Um, after you know several weeks, we saw that this was only uh, it, it was no longer going to prevent um, those that had lawful status in the U.S. and other connections to U.S. citizens from entering, but rather it was going to continue to be used from for uh, refugees and, and attempted asylum seekers from entering the southern border to try to claim asylum. Uh, it is legal to uh, uh, prior to Title Forty Two. It was lawful to come to a port of entry at the southern border or northern border um, and to tell the officer at the port of entry, I am scared to return to my country of origin and um, I, I have a credible fear of, of return. They could be screened and then depending on the immigration process, admitted in, depending on the mechanism for entry, admitted in to, um, to try to you know, fight their case to try to apply for asylum in the US. At the height of Title 42, we saw that um, uh, uh, children, family units, and unaccompanied children were subject to Title 42, so they were also prevented from coming. Shortly after that, children became exempt from Title 42, and we also see mixed uh, for family units, depending on which area they'd be sent back um, along the border, some departments in Mexico will not admit family units back into Mexico under Title 42. Um, so that has, has really kind of changed um, migratory patterns, and I will say that it's also changed numbers of unaccompanied children, because if a family unit tries to enter and they're subject to Title 42, nope, no chance of asylum, but a child tries to enter on their own, they are, they have all the TVPRA, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, they have a lot of rules that apply to them that require um, them to be admitted into an ORR um, facility. So uh, Title 42 is, is definitely changed the nature of unaccompanied children as well. We see a lot of self-separations at the border, whereas before, uh, we always see ones where they may not be a recognized family unit, right? Um, so it might not be the parent-child, but it's something like aunt and nephew. That's, that child could be unaccompanied because they wouldn't honor the familial relationship. Um, so back to kind of pathways of citizenship here. So uh, for the, as uh, Dolly mentioned, unaccompanied children are undocumented by definition. So that means they are coming to the U.S. without a lawful immigration status. Um, and then we also have uh, non-immigrants. So this is think tourists or temporary work, right? Um, temporary stays in the US. So going from there, uh, we have the immigrant visas and humanitarian status that we just reviewed. Um, so after holding you know, any of these statuses, it kind of depends on the nature that you're, they're applying. Um, they'll go from that status to lawful permanent resident. Generally, you have to be a lawful permanent resident and meet certain criteria for five years, and then you're, uh, you can apply for your US citizenship. So this is uh, the general pathway. Um, it's a really simplified chart to just kind of explain the path, but it is uh, super complicated, and there are barriers uh, throughout this journey. And um, most of the time, or much of the time, a child is stuck here and not even uh, getting to the humanitarian status. Um, so just... Uh, good to point out here. 
Okay. So Dolly mentioned this a little bit, and we've re referenced it a few times. But um, here, let's talk a little bit. So there are unaccompanied children and accompanied. So accompanied children, they're entering as a family unit. Their removal case is processed as a family unit, so they may be docketed with their parent. And let's say they're two siblings. Their cases should be bundled, and they might be heard in, uh, uh, on a certain docket for family units. They might be subject to an expedited docket for family units. We're seeing those across the country. Um, but for unaccompanied children, they're entering without a parent or lawful guardian, and then they might be reunified with the sponsor um, in the, the pathway. So for those children, in the 80s, we saw some really deplorable conditions for children. Um, there was litigation, and we got the settlement agreement. It has been modified, codified. Um, there continues to be a uh, Flores Council that is uh, that can be contacted to go into facilities that may be violating this agreement. So this is a really, really important law um, that uh, talks about school in the facilities, medical care, least restrictive setting. Um, then in uh, you know post 9/11, we had Homeland Security. Um, and that's what created uh, the definition for unaccompanied children and transferred instead of uh, INS to HHS for children. Uh, the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act is what guarantees that children, uh, as I mentioned, they can't be turned back at the border. They have to be processed in for removal proceedings. So they have to get that NTA, that notice to appear in court, and they have to be provided the opportunity for due process of law. Um, as much as that can be when a child's representing themselves. So um, it also um, provided greater protections for special immigrant juvenile visas, which have to do with uh, parental abandonment, neglect, and mistreatment. Um, and um, we did see, you know, throughout these some additional opportunities to provide counsel uh, when possible. Is there anything you wanted to add there? Okay. Okay. Uh, a quick note on asylum versus refugee. So uh, a refugee is someone that's designated as a refugee from outside of the U.S. So in the camps that we would see across the world, um, we see organizations like the United Nations designating a group of individuals as refugees. And then those individuals um, apply and they uh, have a country that receives them for refugee resettlement. So in the U.S. currently under um, this administration, I think we're at 100,000 is our fiscal year cap? Or, I think it's uh, 120. 120. So that's gone up significantly from the prior administrations, uh, but we are not meeting those numbers. Uh, as I think last week, uh, we saw an announcement to try to expand uh, sponsors and programs to accept refugees to try to allow us to maybe get closer to that cap. Um, most refugees are in camps or in this uh, pipeline for resettlement for years, decades, generations, um, which is why we see uh, asylum, uh, you know, we see such large numbers of individuals that may have been designated as refugees entering through our southern border to try the U.S. process. So here, an asylee, by definition, they have to be within the United States. Um, and once they are within the U.S., they can say that they are scared to return to their country of origin for a particular reason, and then their um, application be adjudicated by an appropriate um, entity. So they are meeting the same definition. It's just where they were applying. So um, the definition... Um, of asylum or an asylum seeker or refugee is a person who is unable or unwilling to return to their country of origin or avail themselves to the country's protection because they have suffered past persecution or they have a well-founded fear of future persecution on account of one of the five protected bases. Race, religion, nationality, political opinion, and social group. 
Um, What's interesting here are the last two political opinion and social group is probably our largest categories of asylum seekers. Um, there's a few reasons for that, a particular social group being one of them. It is, uh, it's almost like a catch, a catch-all. Uh, it, uh, it, it is our most litigated group um, because um, it's all done through case law to try to define what is a group um, of individuals that could be protected. There's a, we could do hours and hours of presentations on the rules uh, for social group, but that is our largest one. Uh, whenever we can get a client's case under these other areas, we do. And they're much stronger if we can prove persecution or well-founded fear of persecution on account of one of these grounds than, uh, than we will because obviously you know, race, religion, and nationality, and even political opinion, they, uh, you can see they're more quantifiable, right? You can, um, at least the first three, they're, they're uh, things that you cannot change. So um, that's a little bit about asylum and the work that we do. So I mentioned special immigrant juvenile status, and Dalia does a ton of work in this field. Um, but SIJ is a form of humanitarian relief for only children. Um, officially, uh, someone is eligible for SIJ up until the age of 21, but they have to be defined as a child, so many states would only define a child till 18. So um, I think Sila has a map of the various kind of rule, rules and uh, where it would apply differently. Um, but here, it has to be a child. They have to be uh, a child that's in uh, foster care, that's in the care of ORR, that's living with a non-parent or um, caretaker, or living with only one parent. Um, officially, they had to have been abused, abandoned, or neglected by one or both parents to be eligible for SIJ. Um, to get it, it requires getting a state court order, um, which uh, the judge would enter findings saying that the child has been abused, abandoned, or neglected by one or both parents, and that um, it's unsafe for them to return to their country of origin. Um, it, and sometimes that's where the challenge in these cases reside, is the getting the predicate order, uh, because you have to do it in a venue that you are protecting uh, children's rights, so a venue um, that has jurisdiction over the case. So um, here in Texas, or in the RGV specifically, we are having cases that, uh, SAFTA cases, or suits affecting the parent-child relationship. Uh, we see them in guardianships. We can see them in divorce decrees, getting findings in paternity cases. Um, but we can also, uh, you, here in Texas, we've had success in, in, in various uh, areas to get a declaratory judgment. So the suit is actually just for the SIJ to, to meet the findings. Um, if the child's successful in that predicate order, they can apply for SIJ status. If that's granted, um, then they can apply for their uh, legal permanent residence. Some children are able to apply at the same time. It just depends on um, their country of origin. So that is a lot of really complicated law, and it's, it was said really quickly. Um, we are trying to give you kind of like the broad overview of the landscape of what's affecting children, and this next prong is a big one, the need. Um, there is constantly a need for more attorneys and more legal staff. So here, I think uh, this was one of the questions that had come up, was um, the right of an attorney. So there is no right to an appointed counsel. They can take time to try to find an attorney, um, but unless there is, uh, you know, there are nonprofit organizations, or there's a contractor through uh, the Office of Refugee Resettlement, um, or HHS, to provide services, um, then they, they're out of luck. 
Uh, and there is a greater need than there are available attorneys or organizations that can provide it. Can I ask a quick question? Mm -hmm. Does a child have a better chance of uh, uh, being okay if they have a relative already here, or does that not matter one way or the other? I don't, I don't have data comparing, uh, you know, the level of sponsor with um, the likelihood of, you know, success on a on their um, immigration case, for example, or success in integration into the community. Um, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't affect legal relief. Yeah. So, you know, whether or not you have somebody here, unless it's a parent who's a U.S. citizen or a lawful permanent resident, it doesn't affect the legal case. But I think what we see in practice is that children who are reunited with a parent or a close family relative uh, have more ability. They're just, you know, better supported. And so, you know, they can meet with their lawyer they, you know, they go to the, the interviews, they go to immigration court. If, if an adult is there to, to support them, then they're more likely to continue with their legal case, but it, but it doesn't affect legal relief. Um, Aja said from Word in Black, where does the work you do with the children end? Does it end when they are placed in a facility, placed back with their family? Um, when they are integrated back into so into society, or mm -hmm. like where where do you say your goodbyes to them, if you ever do? That's a great question. Um, so I can answer for Pro Bar as a drug service provider. So we uh, will provide services uh, the moment the children enter the ORR facility. So again, I mentioned the the 23 facilities that we provide services to, as soon as they are admitted into the facility, they, they come onto our list, and we will provide orientation services, we'll screen them, and then as long as the need is there, we'll provide legal representation, uh, particularly when they're forced to proceed in court. So we, uh, we provide legal uh, representation or assistance to all children that have been docketed in court and, and need to proceed with their case. Um, once a child reunifies or they've found a sponsor, and it's a win when we can help them find a sponsor, right? We want, we want the children out of detention. And so once the child is able to reunify for a sponsor, or let's say they don't have an identifiable sponsor and they go to long-term foster care, if they're transferring out of our service region, at that point they'll continue on with a ideally with another legal service provider in in their area of service if they're coming to our area if they stay in South Texas we can continue on the case um, it, but uh, if they we wouldn't stay on if they moved to California for example because the laws would be very different and we wouldn't be able to do in-person representation and then at CELA, it's, uh, CELA is not a direct services provider, but it can provide technical assistance to that new LSP, the new legal services provider, uh, or us, you know, on continuing to serve um, with, uh, to uh, provide legal representation to that child. Mm -hmm. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Um, Eliza Relman from Insider. Um, my question is, what are your outcomes looking like right now? Like, what percentage of your clients, you know, are placed? What percentage are deported? What, what are you seeing at the moment? So we have a broad slide on, you know, rates of success um, and uh, representation rates. Um, and it really does make a difference in whether there is counsel or not. Uh, we're seeing a very small number of children just anecdotally being uh, deported um, or ordered removed uh, while they are in ORR custody. Uh, it's, it's very rare that we would see that uh, right now. And uh, part of the reason for that is that um, 
a lot of cases aren't proceeding under timelines that they would have pre-COVID because of COVID. So oftentimes, because we'll have a congregate care facility like a detention center, COVID levels will be positive. The children won't go to court, so their cases are continued. Um, so while in OR custody, we're seeing very, very low rates of uh, removal orders. Post ORR, when they are reunified with sponsors or family, it varies. Because uh, at that point, it is up to the sponsor and child to continue to go to court, to continue to, find, uh, to fight their case. But you might see that um, if a child doesn't go to court, they get removed in their absence or removed in, in absentia. So that's probably going to be the highest rates of removal orders that we see are from you know, individuals not going to court. Uh, which is one of the first things we do with our orientation of children. But I mean, it's a child too, so they, and they're, they've just survived trauma, so they'll take in what they can, is just really explaining the importance of keeping court dates and, and knowing that. Uh, it's, it's really challenging um, to explain that. But it, you know, it's hard to say. I don't know if you have anything else you want to add to that. You know, cases take so long to go through the court system that I don't know that we have uh, the right data to say what percentage of kids actually get relief in the end. Um, and, you know, EOIR, which is the immigration court system, the agency with, within the immigration courts, is not known for collecting great data. So, um, so we, just don't, we just don't know, um, you know, but so I don't even know we could say like the majority of kids end up getting relief. Um, but like Amy said, it could be, you know, because the kid, you know, the child stops going to immigration court. It could be, you know, because they don't qualify for the relief um, that they're seeking. We see very low grant rates of asylum, for example, um, because most kids are running away from gang violence um, or something like that. And so far it's very, the, you know, Court cases don't recognize that as as a you know as a legitimate asylum case claim. I think I asked you when we first spoke, but I mean, my mind is blown looking at this baby. Really, uh, what is the age range of unaccompanied children that you you work with? So it is until eighteen. Uh, so we see age zero, you know, newborns, um, three months. Uh, to 17 and 300 and you know 64 days. Uh, the greatest percentage, as Dalia mentioned, are are usually um, you know 17 year old, maybe 16 year old boys. Uh, um, is is just the greatest uh, population that we see for a variety of reasons. Um, but uh, otherwise, it's it's anyone under 18 that doesn't have a parent or guardian. But he's like. Six, five. What, what Our that? laws don't distinguish the age, yeah, you know. The, so it it's to the in the eyes of the law, it doesn't matter. Now maybe the judge will have greater they'll they'll exercise greater discretion to allow a child more time, but they there is nothing that um, that says because it's a child that they have a greater right to stay unless they have the hook in the law. Now there is the SIJ visa, right? So if they don't have parent or guardian, and you know, and there are adoption, and, and so maybe then you can get it through a family process through adoption, which is, is again, would be a whole day's training. But um, you know, there, I guess in that way, there's a few additional ways, but otherwise, that's, that's the way it is. What's there? Since I'm right here. Um, Megan Magram from the Dallas Morning News. Um, do you have data on like how many um, family units of kids you see? Like how many kids are coming over as sibling sets, or and does that do they get any sort of special consideration where like trying to keep them together, at least as you know multiple juveniles? Um, I do think ORR has some policy on that, um, and we do see family units or even mother, you know, mother child. Um, if they're both minors, we see them placed together. 
Um, and I wouldn't be able to quote the ORR policy on it, but they do make a concerted effort to do that. If they are both unaccompanied children, though, they won't docket them together. So, so if we're talking court dockets, where you would, um, I had mentioned like a family and then their two kids, like a mom and two kids, they would docket those together, but two unaccompanied children uh, that are just siblings, they wouldn't necessarily docket those together. Hi, I'm Hiba Ansari with Sahan Journal. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the current state of the asylum case backlog and what that means, especially for children, like what that limbo means for them from a legal standpoint, but then also from like a social standpoint as well, just like mm -hmm. being, you know, in limbo. Yes. Um, I don't have a slide today on the asylum backlog, but necessarily, but you can see here the number of pending cases, um, both represented and unrepresented. So if we were looking for all unaccompanied children's cases pending, regardless of uh, the type of case, we're seeing uh, 82,000 uh, that are in court. So here, that um, what we didn't cover is a child does have the right to apply for asylum with U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services and to have their case first adjudicated with that body, but their immigration removal case is largely still pending unless they had counsel who could uh, try to get it dismissed until the asylum interview. And then if you go down to the number of all pending asylum cases, um, it's 700,000. Um, I think that's overall though, right? Not just for children. Yes, that's overall. So that's your backlog. That would include children and adults, 700,000. It is definitely a years long backlog in terms of adjudication. Um, so, you know, the, the asylum office does a process called last in first out. So if you file your asylum application, they try to interview as quickly as possible, but it's only a percentage of cases that get that first interview and everybody else gets put in the docket, which is years long. It's hard to guesstimate how long it is because children's cases should be prioritized too as, as kind of at the head of the line with the asylum unit. Um, but again, with COVID, we saw just kind of like almost uh, for a while, nothing moving forward, and now very little, and more of the first in, first out. Um, yeah, I have one more question, uh, kind of to piggyback off of Rachel. Um, at five years old, he looks about five, six. What would you say is the hardest part, especially for the younger unaccompanied children? Is it understanding the legal proceedings that you're walking them through? Is it getting them to trust you. Um, it's a hard process overall, obviously, but if you had to name a few of the hardest parts with being in their position, from your, from your standpoint, what would you say it is? Yes, um, it, uh, it is very challenging to represent children and to explain. So this, it, and this is just this, a slide that is all the things that a child, you know, any age child is expected, or adult for that matter, to do on their own without an attorney. Um, and I won't go through all of them, but it's really complex. It's complex for me, and I've done 12 years of immigration work, and I'm a lawyer. Um, so it is, I, I would say, the hardest part, other than trying to build, to build rapport and comfort with the child, so they will tell us about their reasons for immigrating, about their trauma and past experiences, which is really hard for a child to convey. Um, even after that, trying to explain this process and just really emphasizing the importance. Um, you know, sometimes that's easier to convey with children and, and they realize, but other times it isn't. Um, and uh, it's really hard to know if it, if it resonates or not, because um, it's really complicated. Um, but the rapport and comfort building is super important. And to, to tell any client, child or adult, that the reason you're asking these questions about their most traumatic times in life is because it's important for their case and their ability to remain in the US. 
Um, but it's really hard for a child to open up to a stranger or anyone about those experiences, um, which is why you know our last prong is that trauma-informed legal services are essential and that we are treating the individual holistically and not just their legal case, uh, which, which adds, you know, further complicates our work. Um, I know that we are almost done, so I'm just gonna speed through these last ones. Um, a number that, a statistic that is reasonably accurate that we can provide um, and Dolly mentioned this, and there's, if you review the slides later about how it is hard to track the data from EOIR, but um, an unaccompanied child with legal representation, and we see that unaccompanied children have about 60%, um, a little less than 60% rates of representation through the initiatives of HHS and other legal service providers, but they're seven times more likely to receive an outcome that would allow them to remain in the US if they have counsel. So a very material difference. And there's also some other rates that they're much more likely to go to, tour, to court, to attend court. Um, so it does make a significant difference to have uh, legal representatives. And you'll see similar rates for adults too. Um, I did promise you all a map. Um, so this, I was a we were able to put on a slide because it was in the news. Um, otherwise, uh, this is just broadly a map of our service area. So you'll see Cameron County, the most east, Willisie, Hidalgo, which where we are now, and Star, and it kind of go follows the border here. Uh, you know, McAllen's directly across from Reynosa. We have Brownsville and Matamoros. Um, so we see migration throughout here, and we see ORR shelters throughout this region. Um, some of the shelters are similar to youth camps. They might have individual cottages where you're staying with like six to eight children, similar uh, ages, demographics. Um, but then you will have some shelters like uh, this one. Does anybody recognize that building? <coughs> anybody guess what that used to be? What? It was a Walmart. So it's the same setup as a Walmart. Um, but anyway, uh, so there are no true walls, just walls that go up to a certain level, and it's just a large warehouse type building. Um, so it really does depend on the contractor and the, the building itself of where the children are housed. So some are much I mean, they are all subject to the same rules that we, the laws, but it really does differ considerably uh, what the environment is like. And here is a look inside uh, a typical room. Um, okay, and the final point on this is that um, we do receive some, uh, you know, some government uh, and non-government funding to do the work here at the border. But one of the largest uh, challenges that we have at ProBar is to hire and retain uh, attorneys and individuals that are qualified to do this work. Um, we, uh, we are in a very isolated region of the country here uh, that, uh, you know, the RGV has, has its own uh, struggles. Um, and it's hard to get individuals to come down and to work in the area. So even though um, we do have uh, funding to, uh, to provide services, one of our biggest struggles is capacity. Um, and so, well, you guys should take this slide, go ahead and write a story about it, get some new talent. No, I, I mean, I'm kidding, but a little bit. Um, <laughs> But it is, it is probably uh, one of our biggest challenges just internally. Um, and, and we are constantly working through strategies to recruit and retain um, uh, qualified representatives to come down to the border and do the work. Um, in our last slide here, and, and I'll just kind of let this sit here, but I touch on this a little bit about what is the biggest challenge in working with children, and it, it really is, um, keeping in mind that uh, you know, almost all of these children have survived horrific uh, challenges. Uh, they, um, they are uh, almost all uh, survivors of trauma. 
and we have to talk about those stories with them. And so it's really important that we realize that, we recognize the science of trauma, and that we're taking uh, really um, specific responses to not re-traumatize children. We do need to hear the stories, but they have, they're not gonna tell us them unless they feel safe and they feel that we're trustworthy. Um, so this is, uh, we are constantly rethinking our model at ProBar and, and Sila's constantly advising on this, that um, you know, we, this is an essential component to the work. And um, it's really an essential component for our staff too, to, to be able to recognize that in, in the uh, clients that we work with, but also in the feelings that you can take uh, you know, personally with uh, vicarious trauma, so. If there aren't any other questions, I'm gonna ask one, I'm gonna put them on the spot in terms of uh, developing story ideas. So um, we'll take a, maybe a couple more. Hi, um, my name is Madison. I work um, at the Post Crescent in Appleton, Wisconsin um, for the USA Today Network in Wisconsin. Um, my question is when these children are coming here and um, you guys are talking to them, do they generally have some form of um, like preparation? Like is there usually like an adult in their life that has said like, hey, when you get to the US, this is what's gonna happen? Or do you generally have to start from scratch and they have no idea of the process? So I've, I haven't come across a child that, you know, sort of has been given a Know Your Rights presentation before <laughs> the Know Your Rights presentation. Um, so I don't think they have anybody in their life that can, you know, give them the scoop about what they're gonna be facing, what kind of questions are gonna be asked, things like that. I don't know if the experience. What we, we do um, in our intake procedures, we do the know your rights and then we'll do an individual intake for all the children. Um, and during that, we will ask about their journey to the US and uh, the stories that we most often hear um, or, or you know, what we're hearing from the children are uh, Usually they've, they've paid a smuggler or someone their family has to help them cross. And then they'll say, walk until you see a CBP agent, um, you know, and turn yourself in. Um, it's rare that we'll see, and we might see some, some coaching that the children may have received either from the smuggler or some other network um, of what they should say. Um, but it's rare that the children understand the complexities of the legal process. Um, so I, I think that's more what, what you hear is just kind of the practical bit until, until they get encountered by an officer. Um, my question is about the voluntary withdrawal. Um, what is uh, the U.S.'s responsibility or, you know, what do they have to do when it comes to if I'm from Guatemala, am I going to be taken back to Guatemala or if I'm from southern Mexico, am I being taken back to where I am actually from or am I just, you know, sent to the other side of the border to figure out how to get back home? So the Trafficking Victim Protections Act lays out the requirements for a voluntary departure, voluntary return for individuals from a non-continuous country, so not Mexico or Canada. Um, so the rules for, um, you know, let's say Guatemala in your example, uh, they would have to go to court and tell the judge that they, they, they no longer want to stay in the U.S., they want to voluntarily depart. Uh, the judge would authorize that with, with safety, uh, um, you know, being considered, and then that um, departure would be arranged with ORR and then the consulate for the time and nature of the of the return. For Mexico, it's a little bit different. As Dali mentioned, it depends on if they had entered ORR. If they have, it'll be a, the similar process. If they haven't, because you know they're uh, a Mexican national, then what happens is uh, CBP agents will work with the Mexican consulate to for a safe repatriation to uh, to Mexico. Um, but it will it will happen outside of ORR. I don't know if there's more you want to add to that. 
Um, I think that the Mexican um, CPS uh, takes custody of, of children. Um, there is some language in the TVPRA on safe repatriation. So there's a organization called KIND and they have a safe repatriation program for kids from Guatemala. Um, so they do some work with local nonprofit organizations to reintegrate children um, into the program. Um, I think, you know, there's some procedure if a child is detained and takes a voluntary departure, they might coordinate with agencies on the ground. But, you know, a lot of kids, or not a lot of kids, but some kids might take voluntary departure when once they're in, released into the community. And, and that, that voluntary departure, they just you know, they return on their own. So there's no agencies that are involved in that process. I had a suspicion this session was going to be popular and they were going to try to keep you here. So um, I want to be mindful of your time. If you could take two more questions and then I will commandeer the mic. Thank you. Um, I wanted to, I've been looking at this trauma-informed care slide and I guess I think a lot of us as journalists um, find ourselves struggling to balance, you know, the need to tell someone's story, but also the desire not to re-traumatize them and trying to find that balance. And I guess I wondered if you have any advice for us about, I, I think what you said earlier about explaining why you're asking questions is like a good guideline that I can apply to my own <laughs> life, but are there any other guidelines you have or like things you see journalists do that drive you crazy or things that you think have been really great? So we have been integrating social workers into our programs and they're the ones giving us the tips uh, because we don't learn this in law school. Um, so, you know, this slide actually came from the social worker at SELA and, you know, she goes over these, these four things. I mean, you have to make sure and, uh, and um, you know, show the child that they're safe. You have to be transparent. So that's where, you know, the need to act, to tell the kid, the, the child, you know, why you're asking the questions. Um, you know, you have to empower them. So a lot of times they, they uh, don't feel power because they've been traumatized in some way. So giving them the choice to, to tell you their story in their way um, is super important. And then to also remember, um, be culturally, um, humble um, because, you know, we understand things differently than a child might. You know, one of the things we struggle with is trying to convince a child to, you know, get mental health services because that might just not be seen um, in the same way um, in their culture. But definitely we're just learning. I feel like I have a lot to learn from our social workers and I'm glad that our network has been started to integrate those practices um, into the, the legal services. Question. I would just add that one, the one thing that we are trying to be really mindful of in our legal work, but also, you know, in our outreach and uh, is to keep it, it child centered because so often the stories uh, can go away from the child's perspective and their thoughts. And, um, and, and really what they've seen happen and, and get into the legal complexities or politics. Um, but that is at least, we at Probar have tried to make a really concerted effort to always bring back, bring it back to, uh, to thinking that, you know, it's about the child. So that's where the focus should be, sorry. Um, how often do you see kids leaving for other states once they are released from the ORR facilities? And what are some of the reasons that they do leave for other states? So we definitely see reunification breakdowns. I mean, it's bound to happen. Most of these kids are teenagers or older teenagers. They're reintegrating into a family that they might not have seen for a very long time. You know, sometimes they feel like the family has moved on without them. Maybe they reunited with mom and she's remarried and has children. So, so we definitely see struggles there. And so, you know, that is when we see uh, family breakdowns and a child might decide that they want to live with a different relative or they, you know, they turn 18 and they decide that they want to become more independent um, and they might move from there. 
community. I don't have any data on you know be migration between states, but um, but definitely there might be breakdown with that initial reunification. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, but the vast majority, you know, we provided services to children in ORR care, about, you know, 25,000 children last year, and the vast majority are transferring out. You know, they're going to other areas, and Dahlia just told me today that one of the highest um, uh, places rate is Houston, that are where we're seeing reunifications, um, but that is on the ORR, you know, where the highest rates but post um, post reunification placement, you know, it's really hard to know. So with this last question, I'm going to build on uh, the comment that was made earlier about stories and you wanting journalists to write a story about lawyers, get more attorneys down here. I sat here and I look at you two women and I wondered, did you go to school, law school, expecting to do this kind of work? Uh, and if you did not, how has your life changed? How has it grown? How has it, how have you benefited from doing this kind of work? Well, I mentioned that, you know, I got my start um, doing this work because I went to a shelter and I had no idea that children were detained and had no right to appointed counsel, that they might have to represent themselves. So, you know, I went, in, I went to law school with the intent to help people. That was like all I knew. I, I'd never met a lawyer before I went uh, in real life, before I went to law school. Um, but, I, but I understood that having a legal degree gives you a lot of power and the ability to help other people. And, and that's what I wanted to do. So, um, so I found my, my niche and I, and I stuck with it. Um, you know, I'm thankful every day for the work that I get to do. I feel very lucky and privileged to meet these kids. They're resilient. They're, they're you know, they're forward looking. Um, you know, I just, it's, I just find it, I find the work so impactful. Um, and if a child is able to integrate into the community and, you know, having legal relief is so life changing and, and changes the course of one person not only their life, but for generations. And I just think that's super important. You grew up in Indiana, did you? I did. So tell us about your journey. <laughs> um, I did grow up in Indiana and went to school and, and practiced there before coming down to the border. But in terms of my journey towards humanitarian immigration, um, you know, I went to law school with the idea that uh, I, I wanted to do international law. Um, and I had a Spanish degree and I wanted to use it internationally. Um, but after kind of taking some courses, which are, have been super impactful for my immigration work, um, I found that the humanitarian nature and where I really wanted to do the work, I had the greatest impact working with domestic law versus international law because then you have, it's a little firmer, right? You have the, whereas international law, it's a lot of recommendations and, and hopes that countries will, will abide by it. And it's really important, but you know, the need is here too. Um, you know, our, our immigration system needs some work. We, we need some, the, some laws to be updated and we just need people that can navigate this very, very complex system to make the impact. Um, uh, I mentioned that, uh, and Dahlia mentioned too, that we do this work uh, because you, you see, you know, a little child like that at the other end of the table and you know that if you hadn't done that work, you wouldn't see um, a change in that child's life. So many areas of the law uh, for an attorney can, uh, you know, uh, business or family law, you don't often get to feel the positive impact of your work, but this is an area where you can. Now, not every day you have a win, right? Um, but you do know that that person is really grateful for your work and that you are making a difference uh, in the lives of the individuals that you that you speak to. So. Um, 
I recommend it for everyone. <laughs> I agree with Amy. There is a story in the human toll, really, and the, and the impact on the people who do this work. Um, find, getting at the reasons that they do this work, getting at the, the costs to their personal lives, but the benefits that they draw. So I hope I'll see at least one feature profile come out of this 15 uh, fellow group here. But in the meantime, we're so grateful to Amy Korolev and Dalia Castillo-Granados for joining us today. So let's show them our appreciation. Thank you.